Welcome to the 2022 Dean's Lecture in Fine Arts. I'm Alana Lindgren, the Dean of the Faculty of Fine Arts, and I'd like to acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasainich peoples whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. I'd also like to say a big thank you to my counterpart, Dr. Joanne Clark, here in the Division of Continuing Studies, and all of her colleagues for hosting the Dean's Lecture Series. It's a wonderful way to showcase and celebrate the research and creative activity that defines the Faculty of Fine Arts. I think you're in for a treat today. Our speaker is Professor Mary Classic from the School of Music, a well-known and highly respected trumpet player who for over 20 years was the principal trumpet player in orchestras across Canada, Mary is also a producer and presenter. For over seven years in Thunder Bay, for instance, she organized the Canadian Celtic Celebration, which was an event that brought from across Canada, the United States, Ireland and the UK, some of the best players and dancers in Celtic music. And if you ask anyone about Mary, they'll tell you that she is a wonderful mentor and inspiration to other musicians, particularly women. Today, the title of Dr. Classic's talk is Trumpet Around the Sun, an exploration of music as a global connection that builds community and dissolves barriers. As you will hear momentarily, Professor Classic's most recent solo recording, Dance Around the Sun, is an innovative musical journey that explores the potential of the trumpet within the context of world music and is in collaboration with 24 musicians from around the globe. Please enjoy the 2022 Dean's Lecture in Fine Arts. Hello and welcome. It's my great pleasure to be part of the 2022 Dean's Lecture Series. I want to thank Dr. Joanne Clark, the Dean of Continuing Studies, and Dr. Alana Lindgren, my Dean in Fine Arts, and Dr. Alexis Luco, my Director in the School of Music. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the Lekwungen speaking people. I live and work on this land which they have cared for. Thank you also to you, the community, for engaging with us through this series. Your interest enriches our commitment to the research and the creative work that excites us. As a performing musician, I'm acutely aware of the reciprocal energy between the sender and the receiver. So I honor your virtual presence with me here today as I share with you some of my creative endeavors, some of my background in the area of music performance and recording and community engagement. I've titled this lecture Trumpet Around the Sun because I'll be using specific examples from my career as a trumpeter to highlight some of the ways in which music from different genres, styles, geographical locations has proven to be a powerful connector of people. The word trumpet in this context is being used as a noun and as a verb. I feel that part of my goal as an artist is to trumpet the importance of human connection, to place it as a high priority our collective responsibility as artists and as people to uplift and empower each other. The title of this lecture could also have been Music Around the World or Music as a Global Connector. That's the general concept that I want to talk about, music as a tool for building community and dissolving borders and barriers of all kinds, including those related to politics, race, class, socioeconomic status, gender, ideologies, and more. As we know, many barriers continue to exist in all of these realms in societies, and it would be equally possible to research the ways in which music and its social constructs have sometimes played a role in fortifying those barriers. But the truth remains that music is something that's experienced and enjoyed by everyone. Therefore, it holds immense power. If we speak about music broadly without any specifics of style, genre, or era, 
It's universally a part of everyone's life in some way. In this lecture, I'll talk about how, through my involvement in various projects in my career, I've witnessed the power of music shaping the lives of so many people in profound ways. My experiences as a musician have led me to intergenerational community building and personal creative projects that include a large diversity of musicians and colleagues from around the world. These collaborations have changed me and challenged me as an artist to see through a wider lens. When we perform music or play with music with others, it's not just about the virtuosic technical achievement of years of practice. The experience takes on a much bigger meaning where we're conduits or vessels, part of something much bigger than ourselves that has the potential to affect humanity in a really profound way. Whether one is consciously aware of it or not, this is the reason that we're attracted to music, the emotional connection, its powerful potential. It's also why certain music has had such incredible longevity. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony symbolizes the struggle between progress and reaction. And indeed, he dedicated his whole life's work to this concept through his composition. In his symphonies, it's often expressed as a struggle between dark minor keys and brilliant and affirming major keys. But there are also so many more subtleties to this concept in his work that don't actually need to be understood by the listener in order to be felt. The climactic fourth movement of Beethoven 9 puts to music Schiller's powerful poem, Ode to Joy, which represents the triumph of universal brotherhood over war and desperation. It's a wish for freedom and peace for all people. It's like it was written for today, and Beethoven had the foresight to know that we would still need this 200 years later. To me, this speaks to the transformative power of music and art. Ultimately, in this lecture, we're going to examine in some detail some of the tracks from my current recording project, which is called Dance Around the Sun. It features the trumpet and all its family members in settings of music from 14 countries with 24 musicians who specialize in specific styles and who use instruments that hold significance for different cultures. The diversity of style and genre for this album is very wide, but there's a red thread that connects the selections through the elements of music, which are rhythm, melody, harmony, and form. There's also a red thread which connects individuals with whom I collaborated on the album and which connects the listeners who are transported to different landscapes and cultures, making the world seem like an accessible and unified place. The project is a perfect illustration of the concept that I'm sharing with you today, music as a global connector. Music as part of the core of our humanity. Singing, dancing, drumming. These are all birthrights and fundamental aspects of our humanness. Modern lifestyles have moved us away from these practices as part of our daily lives in some instances, but they remain embedded in our DNA. I hear so often, oh, I wish I had musical talent, or I'm tone deaf, or I can't dance, I have two left feet. These things may seem true, but they're illusions. Language and inflection are a form of music. There's no hearing person who speaks any verbal language that doesn't have a multitude of tones to which their ear is finely tuned. And dance is bodies in motion to music. But even walking, standing, and sometimes sitting have a natural rhythm that's part of the same ability. The real evidence for music being a part of everyone, however, lies in emotion. Music brings joy, reflection, sadness, excitement, pride, fear, suspense, romance, every human experience to life. A clear illustration of this is through the film industry. The music or the absence of music, which is a sound study in itself, is what tells the story and brings forward emotion. As far as global connection goes, if we took a cross-section of music from film, we would see a huge variety in styles and genres. Music that comes from all around the world. The actual stories and the associating emotions are universal, regardless of culture. Even if we're seeing images that are unfamiliar or challenging to long-held beliefs or limited experience of ours, music can play a role in illuminating our sameness. Before I get into detail about my recording, 
I'd like to talk a little bit about how I came to be able to embark on a global project like this. What contributed to developing the skills, the awareness, and the networking and connections? These are all tangible things that have evolved over my career through different creative experiences, and specifically through my work as an orchestral musician, as well as being a co-director of a high-end music festival, and teaching at intergenerational music camps. Orchestras are living, breathing entities. They are like a single organism made up of many individuals who have dedicated their lives to achieving an incredibly high skill level, which is ultimately transcended to be able to weave their voice into a tapestry of many colors to create something truly magical. It's an amazing job, but also a very demanding job physically, mentally, and emotionally. It's much like being a professional athlete in the dedication and the physical demands, but with smaller muscle groups. The skill of playing an instrument at that level, however, is only a means to an end, and creativity and expression are always the goal. In an orchestra, musicians come together as individuals in rehearsal and in performance to produce something together. There's really no other profession quite like it. After spending 21 years playing principal trumpet in Canadian orchestras, I continue to be in awe of the dedication and discipline of my colleagues in this field. The reward is in the music and the truly magical moments for musicians and the audience that happen when a wonderful conductor, whose job it is to have a vision for the music, draws out the highest potential in each musician to synthesize everything in the name of the artistry and that vision. This kind of experience is, of course, the ideal and sometimes rare, but it's the reason that we aspire to a career in orchestra. Those moments in a Mahler symphony or a Strauss tone poem where you're literally transported to a world where all the emotions of the human experience live and where time stands still. But the daily existence of orchestras in reality is quite multifaceted. And in North America, it's based somewhat on survival. Orchestras need to fill many niches within a community and appeal to a very wide demographic through diverse programming. On top of that, there's a responsibility to be constantly expanding the vision, to be agents and ensembles not only of entertainment, but also of change and awareness. This means that the musician in the orchestra needs to be able to do it all. In my orchestra career, I've played so much of the wonderful Western classical repertoire but I've also played dozens of rock and pop, band cover shows, education concerts, concertos, jazz, big band, world music, choral concerts, concerts on a theme of indigeneity, new music, blues, folk, everything in between. As an orchestral trumpeter and a chamber musician in brass quintets, a job that is both stylistically varied and demanding in terms of expertise and leadership, my skill set has required a lot of versatility. This is something I've truly enjoyed as it's given me the opportunity to develop my artistry in playing many different styles, enabling me to be ready to create the current project. Music is a very social profession, both in terms of the connections that we make with each other, but also in the connections that we make with the community, the listeners, the patrons, and the fans. It was through my work in orchestras that I really got a strong sense of how vital music is to a city and its community. This brings us back to the concept of music as a connector. During my time in the Thunder Bay Symphony, I witnessed a group of artists dedicated to fulfilling that role that connects different age groups, ethnic groups, walks of life, mobilities, neurodiversities, as well as being committed to building cultural and historical connections that are rich to that area. An orchestra is truly a gift to any city. While in Thunder Bay, I was a partner in creating and running a high-level music festival called the Canadian Celtic Celebration. In addition to administrative operations, I had the opportunity to collaborate in performance with top Celtic artists from North America, Ireland, the UK, thereby making connections that paved the start of the path also for my current project. The format for the annual feature concert was that about a dozen individual artists would come together to create new arrangements and performance medleys. This intensive creative experience was enriching for the audience, but also for the artists, 
as it was transformative and again illuminated how deeply music impacts people in positive ways. The festival had several other components, including a youth showcase, intergenerational multi-level workshops, and a Kaylee dance. The word Kaylee in Celtic nations means essentially a social event where there's music, dancing, singing, and storytelling. In North America, it's become mainly associated with called dances or community social dance. I developed the skills to become a professional dance caller, and in doing so, I became witness to one of the most profound experiences of human connection that I believe exists. There are very few intergenerational activities where the level of enjoyment and reward is equal for all participants, regardless of age. This is one. I feel so privileged to have had a podium view of so many smiles and so much laughter. This method of engagement is effective for many reasons, including eye contact, respectful physical touch, confidence building, and most importantly, the collective generation of joy. The energy behind this joy, however, is without a doubt the music. As a caller, I'm profoundly grateful for the live musicians and the energy that they provide. Another beautiful example of witnessing collective joy generated through music is intergenerational music camps. I've had the privilege of intimately observing the inner workings of some of the top intergenerational family music camps in North America as well as working with some of the most dynamic musicians from around the world on their faculties. This has truly shaped how I see my role as a musician and as a teacher. To see such a cross-section of our culture involved in community building, grandparents with grandchildren, parents, single individuals from many walks of life and abilities, teenagers infused with the energy created with their peers, Experienced professional musicians, young aspiring musicians, amateur musicians, beginner musicians, all in an environment of inclusivity and celebration. It was truly transformational for me as an artist and has given me the awareness that I needed for my current recording project. A lot of what I've spoken about so far has been pertaining to live music, live engagement and building connection in this way. A recording project is an entirely different energy, although a listener in many ways associates them together. The way that they're the most different is in terms of process. The goal is the same, to create art that gives meaning to our human collective, but the way to achieve it is almost the reverse. In live performance, flow and spontaneity are the powerful force, the goal. In recording, one absolutely wants to achieve that as well, but the level of detail and attention that's required is very, very high, and precision becomes an equal goal. For most recording artists, the ideal would be to tour with your collaborative musicians and then record after having performed together multiple times. This almost never happens. A successful tour is often based on the success of a recording, so it really needs to come first. The challenge is to make it sound like you've been performing this repertoire together for years. With this particular project, all the musicians will likely never come together to perform live, and a few of them I've never even met in person yet. So the album itself is the art, and the creativity is also the process. Dance Around the Sun is a celebration of people, of cultures, of traditions, and of collaboration. With over 24 collaborative musicians involved, it's had a life of its own, and only recently has revealed its true artistic purpose, which I believe is the unifying power of music, the theme of this lecture. It's important to note that the individual tracks on the album are not intended to be broadly representative of a particular region of people or style. Music is as unique as the individuals that create it, and I simply tried to feature as wide a geographical base as possible. Compositionally, the selections span over 400 years and geographically over 14 countries and six continents. On the album is England with Minuet and Jig, French Canada with Air, Jig and Reel, Algeria, Egypt with Maghreb, Mashriq, Brazil with Jinji, Madagascar with Misahotaka, Nyakama, Argentina with Libertango, Ireland with Slancha, Finland with Tanzi Tan, Japan with Sakura, Poland with Mazurkas, Cuba with Chan Chan, Palestine and Iraq with Samai Nahawand, and Dene Cree territory in Canada with The Journey. There are so many different layers to creating an album like this. 
choosing their repertoire, making arrangements, connecting with artists, and choosing instruments. And then, of course, the recording process itself, which is an esoteric and complex field all on its own. It was important to have great people on board, but not only the musicians, in particular the sound engineer. I've had the great fortune of working with Adrian Dolan on this project. Adrian's astounding expertise in the language of sound engineering and music has been vital to this project, and at times nothing short of magical in putting together such a complex creation. Some of the tracks were done live off the floor in the studio or a performance space playing together, but most were done with individual tracking, each musician recording their parts on their own off of a bed track or a click track, using arrangements that I made, and then sending their tracks in as raw files. The complexity involved in synthesizing these tracks is profound. Timing, placement, intonation, balance, detail of timbre for individual instruments, and then also each other, room sound, edits, edits, more edits, and finally mixing and mastering, which is really the heart of any album. Something that's been a revelation to me throughout this process, and is also the theme of this lecture, is how much it has truly felt like I'm collaborating with my colleagues, even when the musicians are not in the same room, and some of whom I've never even met in person. The unity and connection that we created together is very, very real. This is also a testimony to the fine musicianship of these artists, each of whom has been able to intuit and perceive the subtle musical connections and communications as they record their own parts alongside existing parts. I'd like to single out a few of the tracks from the album to describe the process a bit more and to share with you some of the music. We'll start with an excerpt from Maghreb Mashriq. Maghreb is an Arabic word meaning west. Geographically, it refers to the countries in northern Africa that are north of the Sahara and west of the Nile. The region includes Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. Mashriq refers to the eastern states of the modern Arab world, including Bahrain, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Oman, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Syria, United Arab Emirates, and Yemen. The two tunes on this track are specifically from Algeria and Egypt. On this track, I have Hamin Hanari on Arab percussion, and Hamin is playing the Rik and the Darbuka, or Dumbek Darbuka. Also performing on this track is Pierre Schreier on fiddle, Joseph Phillips on bass, Andrew Hillhouse on guitar, and I'm playing a sea trumpet. In the opening, I use some playing techniques that evoke the cultural and physical landscape of Northern Africa and the Middle East, and Joe evokes a similar stylistic and tonal nuance imitating an oud. Later on in the album, there is also a track from Palestine, which features a wonderful actual oud player, Abdul Wahab Kayali. In Maghreb Mashriq, I want the listener to get a sense of the people and the culture and the landscape. Let's listen to some now.
I'll play more of this track in a moment, but first I'd like to illustrate some of what I was talking about with regards to the studio process with some video clips. In the first clip, Adrian and I are in a Zoom session talking about what I'm perceiving with regards to the balance and timbre of the percussion in the opening that you just heard. I mean, I have on the percussion, like it was recorded close, so I have like a sort of room, a small room sound that's sort of mimicking what room mics would be on that setup. And then I have the big room, which is like the performance room um, that, that everything is in. So there's sort of two layers of that, but it's probably just a bit of both down a little bit. Um, right. I think I just felt like the percussion wasn't as present, like like he was just sitting farther away on stage rather than close to the uh, guitar and the bass. Mm -hmm. in this intro. And that's that's two things. Um, I mean, wetness as far as like the balance of reverb versus dry signal that, that you're hearing, because there is still a dry signal in there. Um, and then we're just adding the wet signal to it. We're blending, blending those two things. So just shifting that balance to hear more of the dry signal will feel closer. Um, but there's also sometimes it's an EQ thing. Um, low mids and, uh, and bass frequencies are something that we hear more of as we come closer. The editing and mixing process often takes much longer than the actual recording or preparing of the music. A great sound engineer like Adrian is also often acting as a producer, guiding the detail of the outcome while understanding and staying true to the artist's vision. Edit details may include things like shifting individual instruments slightly, uh, making micro tuning adjustments, or looking for alternate passages that can be pulled from a different take and then seamlessly inserted. In this clip, you'll be able to watch the sound waves as Adrian works his magic and hear some typical communication that would happen during this process. This is a um, weird, tiny little detail, but um, da -da 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 is there a cleaner of my triplet pickup there? Perhaps. Let's check a few things off here. Uh, sure. Okay, okay, so that tuning with fiddle fixed. The third A, were the random jingles we're okay yeah. with. Yeah. yeah. They kind of just are where they are. And the end of this B section that we're in right now, mm -hmm. something got off a tiny bit. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that. There. Nobody's going to care, no. <laughs> except for me. But, um, you know, I don't know What's if there's another. To be? Oh, just cleaner. Just more uh, articulate. Is that the only time it happens down the octave there? Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's that's clean. That's the previous that's nice. time, time through. Okay, yeah. let's, do, let's do that. Mixing is a very important step once edits are basically complete. Mixing is the process of optimizing and combining multi-track recordings into a final mono, stereo, or surround sound product. Part of mixing is something called automation, which really means finding the right balance in every moment and then also as a whole. So, I mean, everything at this point, all these lines are, are automation lines. <laughs> okay. So like as, as it's going through each section, um, you know, things are, I'm drawing in like, okay, this is just gonna come down for this little section or this little note or whatever it is. You know, you just kind of keep adding more and more to this until you've got these beautiful little pieces of art right. uh, with, with all these things. So anything <laughs> that's not coming across, I'm sort of like, you know, bumping up the little fills in between okay, the things. Okay, cool. Um, and then, so if overall balance is there, but it's like, okay, there's a little section or whatever, then it's just a matter of... Ultimately, it all culminates into a sound that transports you to another land. Let's listen to the rest of this track now.
Arrangements are another major facet of this project, and in many cases, they evolved during the recording process. I'll use Sakura as an example, which is the track from Japan. Sakura is a traditional Japanese melody, often sung as a children's song. It depicts the beautiful cherry blossoms, which bloom in abundance all over Japan and Victoria, but only for a fleeting few weeks. This bloom symbolizes transience and non-attachment. I created this arrangement having only the simple melody to start. I imagined the beautiful mellow sounds of a flugelhorn playing that melody, mixed then with viola and marimba and I immediately thought of two colleagues who are of Japanese origin. When I started to think about how to use those sounds, I wrote some counter melodies, and then I imagined a young pure voice as a third melody instrument. Ambient percussion like triangle and bamboo wind chimes were also sampled in the session, not knowing exactly how they would be used. So although much of the arranging happened before the studio sessions, a lot of it also happened during the editing process with Adrian's input. Let's listen to part of this track and you'll be able to hear the melody, the counter melodies, and different timbres and sounds. This track features Kenji Fuse on viola, Tamsin Klazak Schreier on voice, and Masako Haki on percussion. I'm playing a flugelhorn. One of the most exciting things about this recording was the use of different instruments for each track. 
I tried to use at least some instruments specific to each style of music. Scandinavia has an instrument called the nickel harpa, which is somewhat like a violin, but in addition to the four played strings, has 12 sympathetic strings. These strings are tuned in half steps, one string for every possible pitch in a scale, so that every time a note is played, at least one other string will be resonating. The effect that this creates is like a built-in reverb, or like playing in a cathedral. The keys played with the left hand are attached to long, thin pieces of wood called tangents, and the tangents align with certain points along the string to then correspond with a specific pitch in the harmonic series. For the finished set, this seemed like an appropriate choice, although the nickel harpa is actually a Swedish instrument. The track is a combination of two tunes, a Finnish waltz from Vita and a traditional Finnish dance tune called Eliaxen Spelli. This track features Kirsty Money on nickel harpa, Kieran Klasik Schreier on viola, and I'm playing piccolo trumpet.
The track from Madagascar is a tour de force of unique African instruments, all played by the fabulous Chinobe, a musician from Uganda who now lives in the United States. Misahotaka Niakama is a great example of layered multi-tracking process in that Chinobe is playing several instruments at the same time and I'm playing several voices of flugelhorn at the same time to achieve the unique West African homophonic multi-part vocal style which you'll hear in the choruses and is often called call and response. Call and response is interesting in that you find very similar forms no matter where you are in the world. Form is a welcome parameter for artists in that you can actually be more creative when you have some restrictions. Chinobe is playing four instruments, the ngoma, drum, similar to a djembe, kalimba, a resonant wooden soundboard with metal keys played by the thumbs, Kora, a long-necked gourd stringed instrument of the Malinka people of Western Africa. And there's also a solo on tama, or talking drum, which is an hourglass-shaped drum from West Africa, and whose pitch can be regulated to mimic the tone and prosody of human speech. Let's watch a short demonstration video of Chinobe playing the talking drum to become familiar with this sound. <laughs> The African piece that I recorded is by the wonderful Valiha player Rajari from Madagascar. Rajari is an ambassador for the Valiha, which is also known as a tube zither, and it's made from Madagascar bamboo. It has 20 to 24 strings, which are often made from unwound bicycle brake cables. As a result of a childhood illness, Rajari lost all the fingers on one of his hands. As a teen, he developed a unique playing technique, and he went on to found a national Valiha school in Madagascar. This song is originally in the Malagasy language. The title, Misahotaka Niakama, means both the friends are afraid and uproar among the people. It speaks of difficulties in the village with illness, corruption, politics, and many stresses on the spirit. Countries where the people have been marginalized and oppressed often produce amazing music, which is art for a purpose. Its purpose is often to inspire and celebrate unity, but it's also to share information, similar to a newspaper or a town crier. The sound of the music in Misahotaka Niakama is very joyous, and yet the lyrics are very troubled. This creates a wonderful juxtaposition, things that are great compared to things that are not great. This is a juxtaposition that we hear from many musicians in African countries. In my version, the flugelhorn is the verse call voice, as well as the chorus response voices. In the verses, I try to capture the inflections of the words, uh, the language, and a little bit of the storytelling. Also performing on this track is Mark Atkinson on guitar and Scott White on bass. The layering on this track is extensive, and there are moments where we have 10 instruments playing, including all the wonderful percussion of Chinobe.
final track that I'd like to highlight in this lecture is also the final track on the album. It features Dene Cree composer and singer Cheryl Siwapagaham from Little Red River First Nation. It's her composition called The Journey. When Cheryl and I recorded this music, we had never met, but we finally did have a chance to meet when Cheryl was at UVic for the Indigenous Educators Conference. It was wonderful to have that connection, and because we had already created something together, we felt that we knew each other. Again, this is a testimony to the theme of this lecture, Music as Connector. In this music, the sound of the moosehide drum is like a heartbeat. The voice is singing the Cree language words, which translate as, I am walking on the path of others before me. In traditional Indigenous singing, we also hear what are called vocables, which are non-word sounds that support intention and meaning and are rooted in emotion. This sound is very meaningful for me as I grew up in Alberta on Treaty 7 territory. It really feels like a gift for me to be able to collaborate with all the wonderful musicians in the album, but also to learn about different cultures through this project, including those of my own country through artists like Cheryl. This album to me is a tapestry of different parts of the world. The artists and the compositions are the threads that weave it together and it connects the listener to the undeniable truth that we are all one. Music is a unifying force of comfort, inspiration, empowerment, and truth. As I record this lecture, Ukraine continues to fight for its sovereignty and the world attempts to unite in solidarity. Music is playing a significant role as a voice of protest, hope, and of unity. I'll leave you now with The Journey, which also features Adrian Dolan on piano. I'd like to thank the production team at Continuing Studies, and I'd also like to thank you for listening to this lecture. And I invite you to think about how music as a connector plays a part in your own life and your community.